Thank you, and thanks for taking time out of your long, busy day to attend this. I know it can be end up being a really long day, six to nine, uh, but I promise I will try to make this fun and interactive. So tonight's session is called the Nine Entrepreneurial Obstacles and How to Overcome Them with Superhero Solutions. So I'm going to talk about the mental game tonight because in entrepreneurship, Everybody talks about venture capital, they talk about bootstrapping, they talk about all the technical things, but nobody talks about the inside game and the mind of an entrepreneur. And most entrepreneurs are plagued by certain things, but these are some of the ones that I've been able to isolate that are common amongst entrepreneurs. So just, just out of curiosity, how many people are curious about entrepreneurship, just by a show of hands? How many people are actually running a business, have your own business? Whoa, quite a few. Okay, and how many people are sort of um, uh, toying with the idea but not really sure about entrepreneurship? They kind of just want to find out what it's like. Okay, cool. All right, so this is definitely for you. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly go through tonight's agenda and uh, just outline, you know, what we're going to go through for the evening. So the first thing I want to do is, Cleo, you need to come back here. Okay. All right, so I just want to give some thank yous because... Uh, the startup school, Ryerson Startup School, is awesome. And you guys have to agree with me, this is one of the leading uh, incubator startup incubators in North America. A lot of uh, million dollar, keep coming over, uh, million dollar startups have come right out of this DMZ zone. But I want to give a special thanks to Sean Wise and also for inviting me to be a lecturer here. But f I've been here for three years now, and every year this is my, the highlight of my year. And my cousin is here, and my good friend is here, and they can tell you, this is something that I look forward to every single year. Anyway, so it's a pleasure to actually prepare for this, and hopefully you'll enjoy the evening. Now, Cleo, I want you to give her a round of applause, because she, puts, she works hard behind the scenes, getting reg everybody registered, getting the speakers coordinated. She manages the whole program, and she's been doing a pretty kick-ass job for the last, how many years? Three. Three years. <laughs> so please... Give her a resounding <laughs> applause. Woo! And I have, I have actually a little thank you for her. She gets a, she gets a Carol special. I always like to bling out my cards, and I made her a handmade necklace. So oh, there you go. Carol. Thank you, Cleo. You're so cute. <laughs> Did you bedazzle? I bedazzled it. Just for, just for you. Bedazzled. Bedazzle. I always bedazzle. I always bedazzle. <laughs> oh, hey, what's happening? We lost some power. Oh, is it, did I hit the wrong button? Oh, here we go. Sorry. All right. Okay. A little bit about me, and I promise I'll roll through this really quickly. Um, and, and that's what we're going to talk about just in the next slide. Uh, we're going to go through part one of the evening. We're going to go through the nine obstacles. So we're gonna, the first part of this evening, we're going to look at the first four. So number one is the imposter syndrome. And if you haven't heard about it, it's a phenomenon amongst uh, leaders, business leaders and entrepreneurs when they reach success and it's that feeling of inadequacy like you're a fraud. We're going to talk about the sunken place and I took this reference from the movie Get Out. How many people have seen Get Out? All right, you are my people. I'm in the right room. Okay, uh, I'm going to take, and that is that, that feeling when you're paralyzed. Sometimes you just hit a roadblock, you, you lose momentum. And then I'm going to talk about the twin the terrible twins, I call them twin fears, the fear of success and the fear of failure. And then we're going to look at feast or famine because with every business cycle, uh, you are going to have feast or famine and sometimes you got more month than money. And you know, any entrepreneur in this room that has gone through that can tell you they've, they've reached the famine times. Then we're going to have a 15 minute break and then we're going to start with part two of the program. We're going to talk about getting punched in the face. And getting punched in the face is when life, unexpected things come at you and you never see it coming. And um, then we're going to talk about that killing your critic. Everybody's got that inside nattering uh, critic inside of your head. Oh, you're not good enough. Oh, no, they won't accept you. Oh, no, that's not a good idea. And that's that nattering uh, inner voice that tries to self-sabotage. We're going we're gonna to address that aspect of things. And then we're going to talk about losing sight of your greatest currency. And it's actually not money. And I'll leave that one as a mystery so that you're compelled to come back for the second half. And then forgetting your why. Sometimes you can get off track 
and you can get obsessed with making money or people, other people's opinions of you or your business, and you can lose sight of your original purpose and why you actually started your business. So we're going to take a look at how to counteract that. And then we're going to talk about giving up when there's fight in you. Sometimes you can be so worn out because you know, life or a business vacillates from one you know, degree to another and you feel so worn out by life and business and your opponents. Anyway, so let's get started. Hi, there's a seat right over here. You can just, or you can just scoot around quick. Yeah. <laughs> There's another, so you can I sit there? Okay. Uh, okay, so this is a little bit about me. Uh, my background is in financial services, in three key sectors. In financial services, I cut my teeth in financial services for about 23 years. I started as a receptionist and uh, worked my way through a third party mutual fund administrator. And then when I left there 14 years later, I was in marketing and senior management. And then I went on to insurance and uh, managed uh, segregated funds and then I went on from there to international development and then from there I went into government services as a director with the provincial government and then more recently I started my own business doing business consulting and coaching and this is uh, some of the highlights of just a few a couple of years ago and now uh, just over the summer I got to film my first TV interview with um, Afro Global TV and talk about leadership and uh, on Omni TV also, I had a chance to speak at the um, Global Change Initiative about stakeholder engagement and working in international development. And I picked up a couple of mentees. I don't see them in the room, but I do mentorship as a part of my business model. I believe in giving back. I'm very passionate about mentorship. And so every year I come here, I happen to pick up a couple of mentees and it, it gives, me, gives me a great deal of fulfillment, but I love the aspect of mutual learning. I learn just as much from my mentees as they learn from me. And Startup Toronto is another great organization that actually operates out of Ted Rogers School of Management and they're in alignment with, uh, with Ryerson. That's Craig Major. And I had an opportunity to speak last year on women in entrepreneurship and women in business and, and networking. So uh, that's that aspect of things. And uh, interestingly, I worked in Ethiopia when I was doing site visits and I, I headed up a collaborative with the Clinton Foundation the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and one of the leading HIV AIDS uh, hospitals in, in Addis Ababa, Alert Hospital. These are some of the micro enterprise uh, visits that I did in the rural areas. The one on the top left, that is a Shea ba uh, butter making uh, enterprise in Senegal. The one in the middle is some young women who are making school uniforms for profit in Ethiopia. And then on the far right is a composting project uh, in uh, Burkina Faso and as well in Burkina Faso. This is a soap making uh, enterprise and as well back to Ethiopia over on the far on the lower right. That is women who do leather goods. And some of these women were actually prostitutes that one of the local project managers got, gathered together and took them off the streets and gave them something constructive to do. And now they're doing that and they're exporting them at fair trade. So it was really amazing to have all these fantastic opportunities, which brings me to this now. Okay, so let's take a, a baseline look at what is an entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur is one who organizes, manages, and assumes the risk of a business or an enterprise. So I just want to inform you that tonight is not a lecture. It's not going to be your boring lecture where you're going to be checking your phone or, you know, yawning. This is a tribal council meeting. Everybody here is from the same tribe. We uh, have a, this passion and desire to use our collective talents and gifts to put it into society to make a difference, to make a contribution in a crisis, and to also just give the best that we have into community. So I think this, you would agree that this is a tribal meeting. And what I'm going to do, and I want you to humor me this, this evening, is that superheroes and entrepreneurs have a lot in common. 
and I want to draw the correlation between the entrepreneur and the superhero and also take a look at the villains. And these are metaphors for what's going on in your mental game. So the villains are the, those self-deprecating thoughts. Those are the, the thoughts, I call them the villains or the enemies, that try to take you down. The superhero element are the things that try to empower you to move your game forward. So winning really and truly for the entrepreneur is an inside game. It's a mental game and you're, you have to make sure that you're putting good things into your mental toolkit so that you can have that fortitude. So I'm going to take a look because there are three major things that I'm truly, truly, truly passionate about. Number one, I love business. Some, some of my friends like really reading Harlequin romance. They love, you know, reading all the whatever magazines. But I love a good business book and I love business. I also love pop culture and I love movies. And so I thought, why don't we draw some of the parallels that we're going to be looking at internally and take a look at some of the popular culture and see what we can learn from it. So Beyonce, her government name is Beyonce Giselle uh, uh, Knowles Carter. And when she was growing up, she actually was painfully shy. She was very insular and her mother said to her, you know, let's try and get her a little bit more extroverted and get her to play with a lot of the other kids. So her mother put her into dance and tap and whatnot. And e even as she got older, she's, she didn't get over being shy, but she knew she had a lot to offer in way of talent. And so she thought, I got to get you know, myself together. I got to find a way to get this out. And so she developed an alter ego and that alter ego is called Sasha Fierce. So every time she's performing on stage and totally killing it in arenas around the world, she is, do she is doing it in the mentality of her Sasha Fierce. Uh, the guy in the middle, this is no uh, actually the Notorious B.I.G., but his government name is uh, Christopher Latour Wallace. And he grew up a chubby kid, lazy eye, a lisp, but he knew he had flow, he knew he could rap, he knew he could communicate what was happening in the neighborhood. And he found a way to move past his seeming impediments as well. And he decided to call himself the notorious B.I.G. or Biggie Smalls, which is kind of an oxymoron, Biggie Smalls. But he was able to do that, have flow and have great success in his career. And this uh, very interesting looking woman on the right is Lady Gaga. And her name is Stephanie, I think it's Grimaldi. And she was growing up awkward outsider. Uh, kids didn't really relate to her. She did everything counterculture. And uh, she thought she's a very talented songwriter, very ta talented singer, actress. And she had to find a way to get her talent to bear. And so she created the name Lady Gaga. And the Gaga part of it is taken by one of my favorite pop bands, actually. It's uh, Queen. Queen had a song back in the day called Radio Gaga, and she took the Gaga part from, from Queen. So a little interesting piece of trivia there. So what I want you guys to do is I want you to take five minutes right now because if winning an entrepreneurship is a, a mental game, inside game, I want you all to come up with your own name for your own alter ego or your own superhero. And I want you to do that. Just take a couple of minutes. Think about it. What would you call yourself if you had to name your alter ego? So I'll let you figure that out and then we'll come back in a few minutes and then after uh, I'll ask you to introduce yourself to at least three people in the room. That way we can get warmed up. You're not going to be sitting here stationary. Um, I want you to introduce, introduce yourself to at least three people in the room. So I'll give you a few minutes to name your superhero alter ego superhero or super shiro because I have to acknowledge the feminine heroes uh, at that alter ego make sure that when you are going into your business that that is the element that you're thinking about to bring out the best version of yourself so I do that exercise just to say the same way that these guys in pop culture can have this other persona that helps them kick it in gear think about your you know yourself in that aspect it doesn't even necessarily have to be uh, a name that you make up I just did that to get you into the idea of having a part of you that is the super side that's going to take action all right so 
I just want to introduce you to my superhero, uh, my super Shiro, and this is me. And I picked the name Malkia. And this is Malkia. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the reason why I picked the name Malkia is uh, Malkia in Swahili, and, and Swahili means queen. And I think as women, we all have to see ourselves as queens. But mine has a different story. I, I use that name because definitely I think that we as women are all queens. But my, uh, to, this is a very little known story. I don't even think my friend Audrey or my cousin actually know this story. But my grandmother on my father's side my great-grandmother had the brilliant idea of calling my grandmother Queen Elizabeth. So, <laughs> so her government name is actually Queen Elizabeth, and I guess I, that's why I act like a princess, <laughs> and everything has to be sparkly. But she came, I'm from, originally from the UK, I was born in London, and when my grandmother came to visit us and all her grandchildren in, in England, she was at customs in London, and the customs officers were having a rip-roaring uh, time looking at her passport. My, my father and my uh, godfather were there watching them all having a real chuckle at her passport. And they're like, hey, cool, blimey, take a look at this. We got another queen here. Like, and then, you know, they were going on about her, her passport. But anyway, that it's an homage to my grandmother and also the fact that I, I want to embody the queen inside of me and to make the royal decisions. Um, my superpower is that I love to take complex business concepts and I love to simplify them and create a mashup of my other passions, which is pop culture and movies, and contemporize them and make it fun and make it informing, informative in an otherwise boring topic. So I want to take a look at how seven ways that entrepreneurs are like superheroes. They're fully aware of their weaknesses. So you've got Clark Kent, Superman, uh, kryptonite is his weakness. Uh, you've got, they make peace with their flaws and their imperfections. Uh, Jessica Jones, how many people know Jessica Jones? All right, see? And Jessica Jones, she knows she's flawed. She knows she's a little cray cray, but she made peace with it and she tries to do better. Uh, they all act in spite of their fears, and many of us, sometimes we know we just have to act regardless of how we feel. They're passionate and they live for a greater purpose uh, than themselves, and they love adding value. And they have a strong sense of independence, and I'm sure if I spoke to each one of you individually here, that you're okay with doing things independently, you're okay doing things by yourself. Uh, their superpowers are unique to them, so while you know, Superman's got his gifting, I have mine. Everybody here has something to bring to the table individually. And then, you know, they're badass, they're brave, and they challenge the status quo. And that's what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs look at things as they are, and they want to see something completely different. And they create industry, they create jobs, but they create a future and they create hope. So this is how entrepreneurs are like superheroes. So, how many people here have seen the Black Panther movie? All right. You are my people. Okay, so because I'm still on the Black Panther fever, I decided to incorporate elements of it into this so that we could draw on some of the strengths of some of the, the uh, characters in the Black Panther and also beware of some of the villains and, and those negative voices in our heads with some of the characters as well. So entrepreneurs deal with that with the mental battlefield of the mind. We have the yin and the yang. We've got aspects of our personality that just seem like it wants to sabotage us. It wants to take us down. And then there's aspects of our personality that wants to keep moving things forward. So this is, it's in this context that we are actually going to move the evening forward and we're going to take a look at that so that we can, at the end of this, you can have some practical experience uh, advice for some of the common obstacles in entrepreneurship. So, this book by, uh, it's called A Hero of a Thousand Faces. This is Joseph Campbell who wrote this book and it talks about the different elements of our personalities and how we're multifaceted and, and there's a hero in all of us. Now, how many people know, uh, how many people watch the show How to Get Away with Murder or, or know the show How to Get Away with Murder? Okay, so everybody here knows the lead actress who's a triple threat, uh, Viola Davis. She's a triple threat because she's won an Oscar, an Emmy, and a Tony. And she said, in her life, 
outside of the Bible. There's only one book that has been her most influential book that she's ever read, and it's this book by Joseph Campbell <laughs> called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And a lot of other celebrities have actually read this book and said it, it's really been instrumental in their life. Now, see Steve Blanks, he is a Silicon Valley uh, serial entrepreneur and venture capitalist, and he developed something called the Customer Development Methodology. Uh, which is a catalyst for the lean startup. So if any of you know about the lean startup and the business model canvas, Steve Blanks is the guy who really originated this. Anyway, he wrote a book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. And the book is aimed at helping entrepreneurs and startups develop good products. But this is an excerpt from the book, and this is what he says about the hero's journey. And he's re this is a reflection on this book, A Hero of a Thousand Faces. And I want you to think of yourselves when you, when, you were here, when you were hearing me read this. The hero's journey is an apt way to think of startups. All new companies and business products begin with an almost myth mythological vision, a hope of what could be, with a goal that few others can see. It's a bright, burning vision that differentiates the entrepreneur from big company CEOs, and startups from existing businesses. Founding entrepreneurs are out to prove that their vision and business are real and not some hallucination. They must abandon the status quo and strike out on what appears to be a new path, often shrouded with uncertainty, obstacles, hardship, disa and disasters that lie ahead. And their journey to test success tests more than financial resources. It tests their stamina, agility, and the limits of courage. And this is where I want to draw the parallels with the characteristics of entrepreneurship, is with the characteristics of a superhero and that perilous journey and adventure that we all have to go on, the same way that the catalysts in these movies do, we do in real life. Okay. So one of the first things that I wanted to talk about is something that people don't talk about. And this is something that plagues a lot of entrepreneurs or leaders in the business industry. It's something called the imposter syndrome. And I first became acquainted with the imposter syndrome. I was reading an excellent book uh, by a woman by the name of Barbara Stanny, and it was called The Secrets of Six-Figure Income Women. I was sitting at a threshold and I wanted to know what it was like to go over the top and make the six figures. And this woman wrote this book and it takes a look at what it takes to actually to do that. But it's an excellent book if you want to take a look at it. But she talks about the imposter syndrome. And so this is, we all wear social masks. This is Killmonger. This is Eric Killmonger from Black Panther when he stole the mask. But anyway, we all wear social masks. And we are different people when we're with our family. We're different people when we're with our colleagues. We are different people when we're with our pastor or, you know, different friends. And so we all have the ability to put on a different persona when we're with different people. But the imposter syndrome is something completely different than just wearing a social mask. The imposter syndrome is this. The imposter syndrome, also known as the imposter phenomenon, is the fraud syndrome or the imposter experience. It's a concept describing individuals who are marked by an inability to internalize their accomplishments or their success. And they have persistent fear of being exposed. And I'm gonna share and be vulnerable and real with you guys. When I got promoted to position, a senior position, even though I was successively, progressively getting promoted, when I got the position in senior management, I thought, oh my God, I'm out of my depth. I don't know if I can do this. They are gonna find out I'm a fraud and whatnot. Even though my boss was telling me what a great job I was doing, it was hard for me to internalize that commendation. And a lot of executives suffer from this. A lot of startup uh, entrepreneurs, CEOs suffer from the imposter syndrome. If you go to YouTube, you'll see there are at least half a dozen or more a YouTube, including TED Talks, Business Insider, Forbes Magazine, uh, Psychological Today, uh, Psychology Today, all talk about the imposter syndrome. So this is something I wanted to bring to the forefront because if you 
have experienced this, or if you haven't experienced this, this is something you want to be aware of as an entrepreneur. You want to know that, oh, this is what it is. And so we're going to talk about some of the tactics to actually dismantle the, the imposter syndrome. So we're going to take a look at the analogy of our other, our superhero. So we've got the, the Eric, um, we've got Killmonger. And that is the disempowering aspect of our psyche. And then we have T'Challa, who is also known as the Black Panther. So here is a superhero solutions for the imposter syndrome. First of all, you can't fix what you don't acknowledge. So acknowledge how you feel, maybe even tell a trusted friend which can, who can give you some objective, objectivity, and separate feelings from fact. Because a lot of times we go on feeling and our feelings are inaccurate. And sometimes they are motivated by faulty belief system, uh, things that you've been told as a child, like maybe you've been told by one of your parents, oh, you're so scattered. And meanwhile, you are a collective person and you're organized, but you hear that and, it, and you take that into your psyche and it becomes a part of your belief system. So you wanna make sure that you challenge th those feelings from, separate the feelings from fact, you want to challenge your long-held assumptions. So I had a little incident the other day. Again, I'm going to share this experience. We have great little convenience stores, little fruit markets on our street where I live. And um, in my, I, don't, I don't know why. I went in and I picked up a couple of, of vegetables and I got some coriander and I was looking in my bag and I thought, oh, I think she's overcharged me. They're always overcharging. And I thought, so I went, marched back to the store and incensed and I, I put the bag on. I said, I think you've overcharged me. And so I took the items out of the bag and I said, you've got eight items on my receipt and there are only seven items in here. And she took them out very patiently and of course there were the right amount. There were eight items in the bag. So of course I had egg on my face. I had to apologize. But as I left the store, I started thinking, where did this, this faulty belief that all these little tiny convenience stores uh, are trying to rip you off? Where did, where did that come from? Because sometimes you get these mindsets, you might have heard it from someone, it might be adopted, and then you take it on as your own belief system. So I challenge you to think uh, over the course of the next week, start thinking about some of the things that you've had as long-held beliefs and challenge them. Also, we want to look, see your mistakes as uh, opportunities for growth and learning. You know, success, when you have success, failure is a rite of passage. Anybody who's ever succeeded in business or in life has failed a million times over. So what you want to do is you want to see that as an opportunity for growth. You want to reframe it as an opportunity for growth. You don't want to take it in as a weed and then make it a self-deprecating uh, uh, fulfillment. You want to say, okay, I made a mistake. I learned from that. It's time to move on. One of my, my, my grandmother's, my father's mother's greatest pieces of advice that she used to tell all of us, and my dad is one of 17, so there's a lot of grandchildren. And she'd say, I'm going to give you the best advice you're going to ever hear in your life. It doesn't matter how old you are. Get over it. So <laughs> that, that is the best advice. Get over it. And so with, when you start to have all of these thoughts, get over it. Okay. Now, one of the things that we commonly do as well is entrepreneurs, anybody for that matter, we all seek validation externally. And maybe we're socialized that way, but as entrepreneurs, you're gonna have to have a different kind of metal in your toolkit, mental metal in your toolkit. You're gonna have to learn that you get your, seek your validation from yourself. You set your goals, you attain those goals, you say way to go self. But you're not looking for validation outside of yourself because if you do that, then you're gonna be a slave to other people's opinions. You want to make sure that your validation comes internally from yourself and that you reward yourself internally so that you're not waiting on somebody to do something for you, okay? So you build rewards in as a motivation. I remember after a long period of time when I wasn't going working out at the gym and I had to get myself back into the mode of going to the gym, I used to play a little game with myself. I went to the dollar store, I got some smiley stickies, I got one of those cheap dollar calendars and I said, I've gotta collect five of these smiley faces on my calendar in a week in order to get a prize. And the prize was a nice bottle of skin lotion. Mm -hmm. so, like, so I had to play that game just to get myself to the gym because I didn't want to go. 
But, you know, sometimes you've got to build in strategies mentally to help yourself win. Okay, how many people have seen the movie Get Out? To me, one of the greatest movies ever. But I love this scene. This is one of my favorite scenes. And this is when he is being hypnotized by the mother. And, um, but he's in that sunken place. And this metaphorically, to me, I drew the analogy on this because we, I don't know anybody in this room has not, who has not at one point felt stuck. Like, you know, you're stuck, you don't know what your next move is, and you don't know what is the next move to make. And so all of us have experienced, this is obstacle number two, this is mental enemy number two, this is being stuck. And you feel that paralyzed, you feel paralyzed, you're like a deer at a headlight crossing, and it's like, what do I do next? So here are a couple signs that you are in that sunken place. Seven signs. So you're not asking the right people uh, the right questions, or you're not listening. Because sometimes people can feel like, I know it all. I don't need to be uh, inquisitive. I don't need to develop wonderment anymore. I know all there is to know. Sometimes it's better to sit at the, the, the hand of somebody else and learn from someone else. Okay, you, ha you haven't found a problem big enough. So you're a startup, your business isn't moving, and you wonder, how come? You, you might be a little fish in a big pond. You might be in a saturated market where everybody else is doing exactly the same as you're doing. So let's, t you know, let's take an example. Let's say you run an accounting firm. You've got your own little uh, accounting firm, but yet everybody, you know, you've got three guys down or three women down the street that do exactly the same as you. So what is your value proposition? What makes you special? So you've got to figure that out. And so you've, a lot of times it's the fact that you haven't cultivated or developed uh, a compelling enough value proposition for your business to move ahead. The other thing is you're missing a piece of the puzzle. Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Um, also, you're paralyzed by fear and you've lost your focus. Sometimes it's a matter of getting your focus back on track as to why you started in the first place. And sometimes you're just lazy. You're not working hard enough. And you don't know the rules. You might be, you show up at a, at a tennis game with a hockey stick. You, you're, not, you're not playing the right game. Or you're on the wrong path. Okay. So I wanted to actually juxtapose these two characters because this, these two characters are played by the same actor. This is uh, Daniel Kaluuya. And in Get Out, he plays a guy who is naive. He is too trusting. And this speaks to the element that we have sometimes. Sometimes we are naive. Sometimes we are too trusting. Uh, and versus, you know, and you put that side by side with Wakabi who in, uh, in uh, the Black Panther, he's opinionated, uh, he is fearless, he is uh, judgmental, but he's assertive. So you've got these two different characters, and they represent actually the characters in your head. Sometimes you are naive, sometimes you trust the wrong people, but in business, especially in entrepreneurship, if you're thinking about startups, one of your greatest tools that you need in your mental toolkit is you need the ability to assess people very quickly and assess them because if you don't then what's going to happen is you know you get in business with the wrong person and it could take you right out of the of your game so you got to cultivate the skill of actually uh, being able to read people really well and read actions don't read words i always say to, to people who say you know tell me things that and they are not consistent with their behavior you know i can't hear what you're saying because your actions are speaking so loud you know so learn to read people it's going to be one of your greatest things in your toolkit and wakabi you know one of the things he also exhibited which is the side that we have to learn is he his lover was a koi and uh she was badass, she's the head of the uh, Dora Milaje, but he knew when to yield to his woman. And sometimes we have to yield to people of greater wisdom than us. Um, you know, James Bond, sometimes he would go rogue. Other times he would yield to M. So sometimes you've got to have that tender balance of when do I give in and when do I listen to a wiser head than mine or, and when do I go with my gut check. 
Now we're going to talk about uh, mental enemy number three. And I call these the terrible twins. These are the twin fears of fear of failure, because most entrepreneurs do fail f fear failure, and also fear of success. And a fear of success, again, comes in when you have the imposter syndrome. Sometimes you're successful, and yet you think, oh, you might have preconceived notions about people who are successful or rich. So we're going to take a look at uh, eight signs that you fear failure. So, you fear, you fear failure if you care too much about what other people think. And this is another piece of advice <coughs> I received from my mother. She said, what people think about you is none of your business. And so I think it's great advice. When you're too caught up with what people think about you, it will, it will, it will trip you up. Also, wor you worry too much about your ability to pursue the future you desire. You worry that people will lose interest in you. You worry about how smart or capable you are. This, this is a symptom of the imposter syndrome. You worry about disappointing people whose opinion you value. You tend to tell people beforehand that you don't expect to succeed in order to lower their expectations. Or once you fail at something, you have trouble imagining success. Also, you often get distracted by tasks that will help you move ahead and you procrastinate at the simplest things or tasks. Eight signs that you actually fear success. You have a faulty belief system or preconceived notions that successful people are nefarious or they're narcissistic or they're bad. You're afraid that success will turn you into something that you don't want to be. And here's the tip. If you actually become outrageously successful, all it does is amplify who you really are. All it does is amplify exactly who you are. Okay, you question whether or not you have the ca capacity to deliver, again, uh, imposter syndrome. You fear haters. I, I hear a lot of people, especially people that I consult with, oh, well, what if I, you know, they have, a, you know, I go on social media, you know, I'm trying to give them a marketing plan and, and um, integrate mar uh, going on social media. What if I get haters? What if I get people posting negative things about my business? They're so obsessed with the, their inability or perceived inability to handle, not handle criticism that they don't move the ball forward. So you fear haters, detractors, trolls, and you think that you won't be able to handle their criticisms. Or you correlate success with something sinister or bad. If somebody is outrageously wealthy, you think, oh, they must have done something you know, horrible to get all that, that cash or that money. And you really don't want to change. Sometimes people are really comfortable with the status quo. Sometimes uh, people have gotten into a pattern and they're, they're too, just too comfortable where they are. Okay, so this is Nakia, and this is, a, a, this is a really easy way, and I've created sort of an acrostic, so this is a hidden message, so A, B, C, D, how to counteract and kill those fears, or at least quiet, si silence those fears. So A, basically take action. Action is an absolute fantastic antidote to fear. Just like anything else, I think Gandhi said, the, the journey of a, th a, a thousand miles begins with one step. So just take one constructive action and move the ball forward. Breathe. Sometimes you're so hyperventilating, you're so um, flustered that you forget to breathe and dial everything back and you know, just breathe through your panic. The other thing is just calm down and get perspective. Because sometimes when you're fearing things, you don't have a right perspective. You're not asking yourself a critical question, which is, can I do something about this? And I think every time you feel fear, you have to ask that singular question, can I do something about this? And then D is for deal directly with your fear. Deal with the fear. And I love this story that I heard once. It's a Native Indian story. And uh, it was a female chief, and she told this story, and she, it, it was a, 
she said that basically when they have hurricanes, that all the animals in the animal kingdom run for higher ground except one animal, and that's the buffalo. The buffalo will see the cyclone or the tornado coming. It will back up. It will, you know, hit its hind's leg, and it will run right through the tornado. Sometimes when life, it, you know, there's a tornado in front of you, sometimes you don't, you don't want to flee for higher ground. You want to go right through it. So that's why I said, be the buffalo. All right? And then sometimes you need to imagine the worst. Uh, most people, it's easy for them because with our sometimes negative thinking, it's easy to imagine the worst. Sometimes you want to be able to imagine the best. So with the same times that you're thinking about, oh, this is what can happen, you want to condition your mind as an entrepreneur also to visualize and see if this actually happens, then this is going to be a great end. I remember seeing an interview with Usain Bolt and, and one of the interviewers asked him, how were you able to, to win an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented amount of races? Like, what is your secret? What's your secret formula? And he said, I visualize myself winning the race. I actually go over mentally, see myself crossing the line. I visualize my stride and then I win the race because I've already won the race in my mind. And in entrepreneurship, you've got to do exactly the same thing. You've got to see yourself winning. And also visualize yourself as fearless. And one of the, tr the traits that uh, Nakia who was, uh, she was a spy from Wakanda, she exhibited was her fearlessness. And that is the aspect of our psyche that we can identify with, with a Nakia. So when you are fearless, you can identify with that superhero or your own. So, mental enemy number four. If you have run a business for any time or you're thinking about anything, you love, I can tell you love this character, don't you? And he's my favorite character, M'Baku. Yeah, he's one of my favorite. Uh, so in a business, you're going to have a cycle of feast or famine. If you are thinking about entrepreneur and I, or entrepreneurship, and I know I spoke to a few of you earlier that said you are thinking about embarking on entrepreneurship, then one of the things that you have to get comfortable with is uncertainty. You've got to make uncertainty your friend because it's part and parcel of entrepreneurship. And you're going to have business cycles and in, sometimes it's industries and you are going to definitely um, you know, go through this feast or famine. Sometimes you're going to have a lot of business coming through the door. You can't answer the phones enough. And sometimes you're waiting for the phone to ring and it's echo radio silence. So, let's take a look at some superhero solutions. And another favorite character of mine is Shuri. And Shuri is the younger baby sister of T'Challa, or the Black Panther. And one thing I like about Shuri is that she's creative. She's a scientist, so she's brilliant. She uses her brain. She helps her brother out. She has loyalty. So, where do you, we're going to think about the persona of Shuri, when we're in our brains thinking about the correlation in terms of overcoming this feast or famine in entrepreneurship. So this is a no-brainer. The first one is save, save for the famine. So you know that it's coming. You know it's a part of the business cycle. You want to make sure that when, th when business is rolling through the doors and everything is great, no, you don't go out and buy a Ferrari. You set aside some for the months where you know it's going to be lean. Um, also, you're going to network with consistency, so you're going to be visible. And I would suggest getting out there at least once a week, go to networking events, uh, volunteer to speak so that you are busy, busy and that you can add to your brand as a business. Also remember that marketing is oxygen to a business. So you're always marketing, even on the down times. If you're an entrepreneur and you have a startup, marketing has got to be like oxygen for you. 
Okay, you want to utilize and leverage technology. So you want to automate where you can, you want to build efficiencies in, you take a look at your, uh, do uh, re-engineering of your operations, you want to, might, might want to take a look at your customer service. Are we answering the phones quick enough? Um, are we automating things like paychecks? Or are, you know, what can we automate? What, how can we make the business more efficient? These are areas that you can look at when you have a down, downtime. You also want to be able to, um, reach out to current and past clients because everybody knows that most business get business through re referrals. Also, you want to speak at events, like I said, you want to um, be visible, create um, an additional stream of passive income. And I think for somebody who is doing a business, yes, you want to focus on your service offering, but you, if you are thinking about uncertainty, then one of the disciplines of risk management is creating another stream of income so that if anything comes at you sideways you have that income coming in and you don't feel as pressure and stressed also that's the time to actually um, examine your uh, cost structure I'm just gonna go back a second you want to examine your cost structure and you want to make sure that your pricing, when you look at your pricing, is it hedged to inflation? Because again, you see a lot of businesses, I've talked to some business owners, they have the same pricing that they had five years ago. They haven't hedged their prices to inflation. And when you are going through a down period of time, this is a time that you want to actually take a look at your whole business. And I would recommend sifting your business through something called the business model canvas. If you haven't looked at the two minute video, there is a two minute video um, on YouTube that will tell you the nine segments, give you a quick run through of what a business canvas is, business model canvas is. So take a look at that. It's very, very, um, informative and effective way of writing your entire business in one page and it helps a business owner iterate so if you want to create other lines of business then you're going to take a look at this business model canvas in fact when i speak at the startup school previously i talked about the one of the segments in the business model canvas Sorry, for YouTube, uh, you just type in business model canvas and it will, it's a two minute video, I think it's two minutes and 19 seconds, and it explains th what the canvas is. And, and to tell you how effective it is, the old uh, business plans are archaic, they're, they're not useful anymore. Nobody binds up a business plan. Uh, this is a way to keep your business actually live. So you, you are able to be nimble, you are able to respond quickly to changes in let's say uh, government or policy or things that affect your business. So being able to have a one page snapshot of your business, knowing your cost structure, knowing your distribution channels, knowing who your target market is. The business ch um, model canvas is the thing that you wanna use. Lego uses it, 3M uses it, Facebook uses it. Every time they want to iterate and create new products, they go back to the business model canvas and they use it. All right, so you also want to rest and refuel your brain. Sometimes the brain and thinking as an entrepreneur needs rest. You need to take a time out, meditate, go by, down by the waterfront, do something that gives your brain a rest. You know, binge watch, Netflix, just anything, listen to classical music, but something to take you off the grid so that when you come back, you're refueled and you're fresh. Also, exercise radical care. Sometimes entrepreneurs are so uh, a little bit workaholics or they work and they're so passionate about what they're doing, they forget to actually take care of themselves. And so pay attention to your hydration, sometimes dehydration. And you need your brain for thinking and it's what, 90% water? So you need to make sure that you're, hi you're hydrated, that you exercise proper nutrition and also supplementation and exercise are your friend. So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little bit of a 15 minute break, because I know you guys need bathroom breaks and whatnot, and then when we come back, we're gonna tackle the second part of it, then we're gonna have a Q&A. So you got 15 minutes to go and refresh yourself and, and uh, talk to other people in the room, and I'll see you back in 15. Everybody okay? All right, I'm gonna ask everybody just to get, stand up and have a little stretch because we're, we're in the home stretch, so I want you to stretch for the home stretch. All right? 
Okay, so we're all going to crack that back, have a nice stretch. All right, okay, good. All right, so are we ready to go? All right, good. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I have a little swig of water. Okay, so now we're into part two. Now we're going to talk about getting punched in the face. Have you ever imagined what it would feel like to get punched in the face by Mike Tyson? Like I thought to my, I, I've wondered what is it like to be on the receiving end of a punch to the face by Mike Tyson? <laughs> Ask who? <Robin>. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so mental enemy number five, this represents when life comes at you sideways. When you're an entrepreneur, sometimes life's events can feel like a punch in the face. And here's what a punch in the face can look like. So a punch in the face can look like illness. So illness comes at you, it's unexpected, or it affects you or your spouse or your parents or a child or you go through a divorce. So you're running a company, you're running a startup, everybody is looking to you for leadership, but you're going through a breakup in your relationship, your personal relationship, and that n takes an impact or makes an impact on you mentally. Uh, also, unexpected death in the family or a loved one. Also, depression. Depression is real. People go through cycles of depression. Sometimes it's situational. And also, other mental illnesses can impact you as a entrepreneur. Also, you know, your business partnerships go sideways. You got into bed in business with the wrong person, not physically, but metaphorically, um, and it goes sideways. And uh, sometimes they clean you out or, you know, you never saw it coming or, you know, next thing you know, you have no money. They took off with the money in your business or you lose a major customer where your business hinges on it. And that is what uh, a major um, punch, in, punch to the face looks like. So just about this time last year, this is what my punch in the face looked like. I'm a solopreneur and one of those little things came at me sideways, but I'm going to take a look at some of the solutions and the things that really help you get back on track after you get a punch in the face. So expect, number one, expect the unexpected. So you want to cultivate rock solid relationships. If you're a loner and you're starting a business, I can honestly tell you from experience and other people that I've counseled or done consulting with that when, when things have gone sideways in their business, your friends, your family, people that you have healthy relationships will make all the difference. And actually I have a few people here that, I, that, that are here to support me and I thank you, but it's made all the difference in my life and also with others. And so make sure that you cultivate rock solid relationships. I can't say that enough as an entrepreneur. Also pray. If you're not a religious person, say daily affirmations, say something positive, but put something positive into the atmosphere that gives you hope and anchors you in hope. And you know, do an act of kindness. Sometimes when I'm feeling sorry for myself, I'll write out some nice cards and bling them out and go to the dollar store and get some blingy butterflies. And I know the person on the receiving end of that card is going to be feeling happy instantly. It, it takes the focus off yourself. You know, you're not navel gazing, but you're thinking about somebody else. And that helps to take the edge off when you get a punch in the face. Keeping your sense of humor. I believe wholeheartedly in laughter therapy. So uh, sometimes I go on YouTube, I'll look at old British comedies like Some Mothers Do Have Them. I'll look at, um, you know, a Carol Burnett show or I Love Lucy. And I laugh for maybe about a half an hour. And it, those happy endorphins make you feel better and it gives you perspective to know that it's not all bad. Um, also silence. Now, this is something I just learned recently. Uh, silence actually is really great for you. And what it does, 
Has any, does anybody know what the word neuroplasticity means? Okay, I'm, uh, can somebody take a crack at it? What does it mean? Um, it means that you can change the, you can basically change your brain even no matter how old you are. Exactly. So neuroplasticity is exactly what he said. It's you can change your brain. So in 2013, they did a study with mice and they put them in a quiet cell for two hours. And interestingly, what happened was those mice actually developed uh, new neurotransmitters in the hippocampus, part of the brain. And that's the part for emotions and learning. And the same applies to human being. When you expose yourself to silence, silence can actually become a superpower. So make sure that when you get a punch to the face that you get quiet, you take time out to get perspective, but while you're getting quiet, please know that you're actually also building, building neurotransmitters in the brain. All right, you're building a super brain. Again, breathe. We forget to breathe, life comes at us, we hyperventilate, we don't know what to do, we get flustered, breathe and meditate. And what I found that's been effective for me when I get a punch in the face is do one constructive thing that moves you forward. It, you, a lot of people make you know, lists and they want to do so many different things and you become overwhelmed. So just taking one thing that's going to move you forward is probably your best angle. Okay, now, this is one of my favorite characters in Kill Bill. And she is a part of the Deadly Viper assassination squad. And I love this scene in the movie because these two women square off and I mean, it's ugly but it's my favorite scene. But she represents that mental enemy number six is that nattering critic in your brain. And that nattering critic in your brain wants to, wants to kill your dreams, wants to kill your joy, wants to kill your happiness. And so you see the persona of Vernita Green as that aspect of your psyche that wants to take you down. It's that self-sabotaging aspect of you. So you want to know how to counteract that. And here are some practical ways that you can uh, counteract that, silence that critic. Okay, so now we're looking at the wise character in the Black Panther. This is Ramona, Ramonda. And she is the mother of the Black Panther. She represents the wiser part of ourselves and our psyche. So what you want to do is listen to your negative thoughts. Listen to what your negative thoughts are saying. People think, oh, don't listen to your negative thoughts. Yeah, listen to your negative thoughts because your negative thoughts are gonna tell you something. They're gonna tell you what your belief system is. It's gonna tell you about patterns of thinking. And one of the things that, that uh, recently came out in a study is that actually, and it was in cognitive behavioral therapy, is that we actually have patterns of thinking. The same way we have patterns of expectation or positive thinking, we can go for years with a certain pattern of negative thinking and you never address it because you never acknowledge it. So this is a way that you listen to your negative thoughts, see if this is a pattern, patterned way of thinking and then address it and reframe and come up with a new way of actually uh, reframing those thoughts. And be aware of your faulty belief system. Also get productive. The best way to overcome fear, to overcome your inner critic, is get moving. You can't, your brain can't handle two things at once. So if you're doing something constructive and you're doing something productive, then you don't have time to listen to the inner critic because you're busy hustling and, and you know, winning. So you also want to rethink about how you see other people. The same way I gave you the earlier scenario with me thinking all convenience stores are there to kind of rip you off and the little corner stores or whatever. Rethink what, what, what you see with people or you may even be an entrepreneur asking for thinking about asking for help in your business or partnering or collaborating but you've already assumed that they're not going to be interested in your business or helping you. So rethink about how you see other people. Number four is what advice? You have to exercise self-compassion. So one of the things I would suggest is that you want to talk to your little five-year-old self. If you were talking to five-year-old self when you got the inner critic nattering in your head, what are you going to say to that child? You're not going to say, oh yeah, you're dumb, you're stupid. You're going to say, no, you're capable. You're capable of learning. You're capable of doing, you know, you're going to be talking to that five-year-old in an affirming way to give them hope. So you need to do that for yourself. 
And then you want to recall your recent successes and remind yourself just how capable you are and how awesome you are. Okay, so mental enemy number seven. And this is probably one of the most important aspects that you need to address as an entrepreneur. So if you're thinking about entrepreneurship or you're already an entrepreneur, this is your greatest currency. And that currency is not money, it is your self-confidence. You need to make sure, like a grizzly bear protects a cub, that you protect your self-confidence. If you're at a job and somebody is making uh, negative remarks to you all the time, putting you down, and it starts whittling away at your self-confidence, you've got to cut that, cut that off. If you have a spouse or a partner or friends that keep saying, self, saying things to you that are negative, you've got to cut that off. You've got to do uh, an audit. And I think somebody on the break talked to me about what do you say uh, you know, when you've got people around you that are, that are you know, having a sort of negative things to, to you. And every year or every six months or so, take an audit of the people around you that you spend the most time with and decide whether or not they're helping you move forward or they're holding you back, and you need to do that. Also, um, I remember when I worked at a job, and um, it was a very senior role, and uh, it just went south. And uh, one of the things that, that it left me with was no confidence, and probably two years, and it's a long time, two years I had no self-confidence because I didn't realize how badly I was in such a toxic environment and how much of my self-confidence I had lost until one day I went to a networking meeting and I met with this guy and he said, wow, you have all these accomplishments, but you don't present to somebody who has these accomplishments. And um, he said, you know, wow, you know, what's, what's going on? You, you, you know, you, you seem like you've lost your confidence. And you don't want to get to that stage. You don't want to let it get to that stage where you're totally depleted. You want to monitor it. You want to make sure that you, uh, you keep healthy relationships around you. But you want to make sure, most, most importantly, you have a healthy relationship with yourself and that you keep your self-confidence at an all-time high. I'm not talking about being obnoxious. I'm talking about a healthy self-regard for yourself and, and your self-esteem. So I love this quote by E.E. E. Cummings, and it says, once we believe in ourselves, we can risk curiosity, wonder, spontaneous delight, or any experience that reveals the human spirit. And super Shiro solutions to losing sight of your greatest currency. So Malkia, who is before you, uh, she is going to give you some super Shiro advice in terms of self-confidence. Number one, it's your greatest currency. Number two, stop comparing yourself to other people. Because a lot of times that you lose your self-confidence is through comparison. And again, a, a really fantastic great aunt of mine who is 90 years old now, living in England, living independently, uh, you know, cultivating her own garden, she always says to me, Carol, comparison breeds discontentment. Don't ever compare yourself to anybody else. And I would pass along that advice to you from my 90-year-old aunt. Um, and also, be like Aristotle of Nassus. Not necessarily in his characteristics, uh, in broad sense. But I read um, an a interesting uh, story about him in The 48 Laws of Power. How many people here have read that book, The 48 Laws of Power? Brilliant book and one of my favorites. And in the book, it, it says, as he was posed the question, what if you lost all of your billion dollars? How would you make that money back? And he said, well, you know what I would do? I would get, I don't care if it's five menial jobs, I would get whatever jobs I could get. I would, at the, every payday, I would put the money towards the most expensive suit I could get. I would find out what is the most expensive restaurant in town and I would show up every payday to that restaurant and I would find out what the most prominent seat in that restaurant is. And then I would make friends with the chef and I would make friends with the wait staff so that everybody built a curiosity about me as this well-dressed man in this restaurant. And then 
all of a sudden my network would change because people would be curious and they start talking to me and before you know it I build back my billions based on association now that is an example of a confident man who if he's posed the question are you lose everything and I'm talking shipping magnet I lose everything uh, he has the confidence that he could build it back and that's what you need to cultivate is to get to the point that you know if you lose everything you could start again and you could do even better all right now you want to do a personal SWOT analysis a SWOT analysis is in marketing it's strengths weaknesses opportunities threats and you want to on a yearly basis take a look at your strengths what are your weaknesses? What are opportunities that you might be missing out on? And what things threaten to take you off kilter? And you wanna do that on yourself, that exercise on yourself. Then you also wanna be kind and you wanna be generous. You also wanna be kind to yourself because sometimes again, these self-deprecating thoughts are gonna be playing in your brain and you wanna be able to make sure that you are kind and you exercise compassion with yourself. The other thing is you wanna stand tall. I got another cute story. My uh, friends and I we went to, to, to uh, Costco and um, as you can see I'm vertically challenged and we went to the store and I got separated from my friends and my friend my childhood friend Michelle said Carol Carol where are you and I said I'm right here and she said oh I didn't realize you were that short you project so tall <laughs> <laughs> and I thought well at least I project tall I'm only 5'1 but at least she thought I was a taller person so you know when you you know want to cultivate confidence part of it is your posture and how you carry yourself um, the other thing is learn something new every time we learn something new it goes back again to neuroplasticity you build new neuron neuro neurotransmitters in your brain and learning something new cultivates that uh, I had an episode with uh, uh, something in the brain and I learned that I, I love belly dancing, so I took up belly dancing, and I learned later on that belly dancing actually makes you smarter because you are working the right and the left side of the brain, and it's actually building neurotransmitters on both sides of the brain. So if you want to get smarter, women, guys, <laughs> take up belly dancing, all right? Also, gratitude. Gratitude is a very powerful, potent thing that you can exercise. I know people say it all the time, but when you feel grateful for what you have, it, it builds the confidence that, you know what, I have a lot to be thankful for. Um, also volunteering. I volunteer uh, throughout my entire career um, in uh, Chamber Orchestra, Symphonia Toronto Chamber Orchestra. I did a project. I sat on a coalition with the Toronto Police to reduce youth violence. Uh, I was, when I was a teenager, I was a Red Cross babysitters to help out single mothers. And not only do you get exposed to a new skill, but you get exposed to a whole new network. So as entrepreneurs, always be in the game and make yourself visible. But one of the ways that you can also um, help yourself is by volunteering. And volunteering can put so many opportunities in front of your path. Um, also focus on solutions. You don't have time to uh, feel inadequate if you're doing something constructive and focusing on solutions. Uh, mental enemy number eight. We're getting down to the wire now. Uh, forgetting your why. You can start a business and you can completely forget why you started the business in the first place. You can get obsessed over making profits, over money, and uh, lose sight of your greater purpose in the large scheme of things. So you want to get back to the middle you want to get back to your original purpose and uh, also you've got to catch yourself when you have that disease to please. Sometimes you're so busy pleasing other people and their agendas you forget about your own. Also you become, um, you start to, to see validation based on others. This goes back to what I said earlier about get it cultivating a mentality inside where you are basing your validation on your own, not externally internally is where you get your validation from, not the opinion of others. And then don't lose sight of your sen sense of self and your business identity. Sometimes people completely separate the two. And a lot of times I'm asked, I would do um, needs assessments with people who were launching out on their business. They just lost their job, major job, and then they're thinking about going into business. And they have these two separate identities. A lot of times you're going to be successful if there is a direct correlation between 
who you are as a person and your business. That has to be married into one. You can't have a separate identity for a business and a brand and then a separate identity for you. You have to marry them together. Also, um, you know, forgetting your why could actually kill your dreams. When you forget about why you started the business, your, your, your business could die in the pasture because you, you're way off course. So you want to make sure that, uh, you know, this, this is a way that you forget your why. So now let's take a look at superhero solutions to remembering your why. And this is Zuri, and he is the father. Uh, he is the wise elder in the villa in Wakanda. And here's the, here's the, um, the cure for forgetting your why. You want to not let other people's agenda throw you off track. You want to revisit it, why you started your business or why you wanted to start your business. And you don't want to make money the main motivator of why you're doing business because money, like everything else, is volatile. And it can vacillate just like an oscillating fan. Okay, you want to focus on making a contribution in a crisis. You want to serve your purpose with your skills and your talents. And you want to focus on a much great, something much greater than yourself, a collective community or making a, a dent in the universe for good. And you want to be clear about your why. Because sometimes people forget their why because they're not really clear about it. Okay, so now this is the piece de resistance. This is my favorite fight scene in Kill Bill with Lucy Liu. And a lot of us, we, you know, we, we are in the game of entrepreneurship and you're ready to give up too quickly. Sometimes you got a lot of fight left in you and because you feel so worn down, you just feel, oh, what's the, he what's the bother? I'm not gonna get up one more time. You know, sales are down, um, people aren't coming through the door, we might as well give up. But I, I would tell you that you better get your butt up off the ground and get in the fight. Okay, so my favorite character in the Black Panther, uh, Koi. She is the, the chief of the, of the Dora Milaje. She is badass and she is fierce. And I love the scene the fight scene, I don't want to give it away, but she just goes off in the red dress and the big spear, but that's my favorite scene. I see myself in that role. I see myself in that role. Okay, so how do you defeat your inner enemy? You want to outwit your, your inner mental enemy by changing up the rules. And I love this story, again, from the 48 Laws of Power. It's Miyamoto Musashi. He is the, the most winningest 16th century samurai fighter. And he won all these, these, uh, these fights and he wrote a book, and I have this book. It's called The Book of the Five Rings. You have that book too, right? Oh, no, oh, it's, yeah, my other mentee. Uh, book of the Five Rings, and he talks about all these tactics. My favorite story is though, is like he, they have these different fights. And there is the fight of the long sword. So Miyamoto Masashi, he made up his own rules. So he showed up at the fight with a short sword. He showed up three hours late and his opponent was really pissed off and saying, hey guy, what's the deal? Like, why are you showing up three hours late? Uh, and this is, a side, this is a fight of the long sword and you've got a short sword. So he's like, really? I'm so sorry. And he quickly stabs the opponent in the neck with the short sword and wins the fight. Well, he changed the rules. He didn't follow the rules. Sometimes when you want to defeat your inner opponent, you got to change the rules, just like Muyamoto, right? Okay, you also, <laughs> also you want to develop a new mental script. And uh, also you want to be able to visualize success um, and you want to overcome victory. Uh, you have to just mentally in your mind know that things will be, there's more working in favor that's working for your good than against you. I remember I used to go salsa dancing with a friend of mine and every time we went there I, I'd say to her, oh we're gonna get a, we're gonna get a parking spot right in front of the club and I would say, parking angels please, can you find us a spot in the front of the club? And sure enough, there would be a spot in front of the club and, and it would happen all the time. Every time we got to the club, I would say my little prayer to the parking angels 
And then one time, she's like, you know, Carol, why are you doing that? That's futile. Like, that, like come on now. Don't be so silly. So I decided to test it. So I decided, okay, next time we go to the club, I'm not going to pray to the parking angels. I'm just going to not do anything. And you know, we didn't get a parking spot. So uh, she kept driving around for 20 minutes. She said, well, aren't you going to pray to the par parking angels? I said, no, well, you said it doesn't work. So let's just keep driving around looking for a parking spot. I had my own for my winning formula in my brain about my parking angels, but you wanted to say, okay, it doesn't work. Anyway, develop your own mental script something where you're seeing yourself winning or getting what you want and develop a new response to failure. When you fail, see that as a rite of passage to success. See that as a stepping stone. See that as an opportunity for growth. Uh, accentuate the positive and make peace with your flaws. And I would say at this point, we're going to take a tweet break. This is going to be something unusual. I want you to get your phones out. This is one time I'm going to ask you to get your phones out. And if you have Twitter, let's get the startup school trending. So I want you to tweet something that you learned tonight about uh, at, at this session and tweet out something about startup school. And it's startup school, are you? And you can tag me in it at Carol Leeds. And, but let's get the startup school trending because this is a phenomenal uh, platform, phenomenal opportunity for entrepreneurs. And um, yeah, this school is worthy of, of uh, commendation. So let's get that tweet. Well, I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. And then I'm going to take your question. So I'll give you about two minutes to tweet out something. And then we'll come back and we'll do a Q&A. And I just want to give you the takeaways. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll retweet them all. Okay, so, uh, so I'll give you another minute and then we're going to look at the takeaways. Carol, can you go back? Go back? Yeah. All right. Okay, so startup school, at startup school, are you? And you can hashtag entrepreneurship, hashtag startup, hashtag startups. And let's get Ryerson Startup School trending. All right. Everybody got that? Pardon me? Yeah. Something that you learned. Something that stuck out with you. I'll give you another half a minute, and then we'll just uh, do the takeaways and then we'll have a q a and the pizza's ready i see it there i don't want it to get cold <laughs> <coughs> all right so let's wrap up all right so the takeaways for this evening are superhero takeaways or if i could encapsulate everything that i've spoken about this evening number one success is a mental and inside game Number two, to thy known self be true. You got to be true to yourself and who you are authentically and uh, what you stand for. Also, you know your purpose and stay on task. Make it a point to stay on task. If you are starting a business, make sure you don't veer, that your boat doesn't go way into the harbor or into the lake, that you stay close to the shore why you wanted to start the business. Cultivate great relationships because they will make the difference in your success. And it doesn't have to be lonely at the top. If you've got great people alongside you, you'll want them to celebrate success with you. Um, watch your cash flow. Uh, live within your means. This is just a practical uh, aspect of life. I got an accountant. I know one accountant in the room. Am I on point, Andrew? Yeah. Right? Watch your cash flow. Uh, live within your means and save your money. Okay? And remember that the most fears are unfounded. Uh, the, uh, somebody used the acrostic, false evidence appearing real. Most fears are unfounded. So make sure you know the facts before you go into hyperventilating and you, you become fearful. And also, fiercely protect your self-confidence like a grizzly bear protects a cub, a baby cub. It's your number one currency. Also, remember why you started the business and don't give up. And now I'm going to ask, any questions? Can we go back? <laughs> okay, we'll go back. All right, <laughs> that's a question. Okay, I'll let you get, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
And after this, if you haven't given Clio your email address, then please do so because this deck will be available to all of you and um, you can have all of these slides from this. But she has to have your, your email address in order for you to get it. Does everybody have this? You have a question? Yes, I do. So how do you cope with the people who are closest to you who don't actually support um, your business secretly? Okay, so the question is, how do you deal with people who are close to you that do not support the business? And this is the second time that this has been raised, and I would say the practical thing for you to do is keep an audit of who you have as your inside influencers in your life. Every year I take a look at my friendships and I say, oh, wow, you need to move to the outer periphery. Uh, somebody explained it this, to me this way. There's some people you keep in the house. There's some people you, you, you let in your bedroom. There's some people you leave on the porch. There's some people you leave out by the lake and there's some people that are close to the lake, right? And friendships can take on a form like that. And you determine who you let have access to you and influence you because it's really important. And they say, uh, I think Brian Tracy, John Maxwell, all of these great business writers said, you become the 10 people that you expose yourself to the most. So you want to make sure that the people that are around you are supporting, your, your, are, are affirming, that are encouraging, that are helping you move the ball forward. If they're always saying, oh, that won't work, a lot of times people project their own uh, their own faulty belief systems. They may come from a family, like I explained earlier to one gentleman, that um, they may come from a family where, they, let's say they didn't have a lot of money and everything they have to save. So you've got an idea where you want to invest in your business and they're saying, oh, no, no, that's too expensive. No, say something happens. And their thoughts and their, their uh, advice to you is fear-based. It's not because they, they're thinking about their own projection. They're not thinking about moving you forward. So the best thing you can do is take an audit of the people that are around you and decide what kind of interaction you're going to have with them. That's the most practical advice I could offer you. All right. Anybody else have a question? Oh, okay. I'll let you go first and then I'll take you over there. Okay, so the question is, you've got a passion, uh, but you have no idea about what you want to do, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Uh, I would say, one of the things that I, that I would recommend is volunteering. Volunteering is a great way of not only rounding up new skills, but when you're in an organization and you can take on different roles, then you can see what you can identify what your strengths are very quickly. So like you work, like I was volunteering in um, the Ontario Trillium Foundation. We were putting about $2 million into community. And I realized that what my strong suit was, was looking at board governance, because I took board uh, governance uh, a course, and I like to take a look at the conflicts of interest, and that was my, the area that I like to work in. Or it might be even doing the marketing aspect of things, because I'm a marketer. But working, sitting on a board, uh, going to networking events through Meetup, or um, Startup Toronto, meeting other entrepreneurs, go, jumping on volunteer projects will give you a really good, accurate idea about what you know, your stronger propensities are. Definitely. And over there? Hi, Hi there. Um, I had a question earlier, but I'm going to change it now. Okay. My question is, or well, I started my small business last year. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So her question was, just so that everybody can hear, is that she started her business last year and now she's finding that the market is saturated with competition. How does she counteract that? So going back to one of the former slides, it was that um, you have to have a compelling value proposition, meaning that the service or product that you're offering 
has to be something that sets you apart from everyone else. So meaning, basically, why would, some, let's say you've got another uh, organ, a company that does exactly the same that you do, then why would somebody else want to do business with you? Are you quick at executing in terms of turning the product over to the end user? Are you excellent at customer service? Uh, do you have a certain niche market that uh, partners with, let's say, a children's charity? Or uh, do you partner with young girls uh, who want to code in computers? Like, what is the angle of your business? Uh, and, and that has to be refined, again, with your business plan. But you look at your competition and you do your competitive analysis, but you have to figure out what sets you apart. And that's why I always bring up the word niche. You have to have a niche market. If you cannot compete at the same level, then you've got to up your ante and have a niche that nobody else has. All right. Any other questions? Oh, one there. How do you find co-founders? Yeah, for it to, well, you might not have all the skills, but um, let's say you're just a designer, but you need programmers and things like that. Yeah. Networking, uh, going online. I, I see a lot of um, things in terms of, uh, of um, you know, opportunities for um, collaboration. Uh, hackathons are great. Uh, I don't know if you've heard. I heard of hackathon uh, last year by one of my mentees. I never heard the word before. And it's when people get together over a weekend and you can pay 40 bucks and people come from all over the city or outside of the city and you get together for a weekend to solve a wicked problem. So hackathons are great p uh, places to meet people, collaborators, because everybody comes with a multidiscipline. All right. Uh, another question back there, Andrew. How do you appro appro approach the sensitive issue of price and value? A lot of businesses go under because they haven't priced themselves accurately in the market. Earlier, I talked about businesses not hedging to inflation. You have to take an, a very sound look at your pricing model and your pricing strategy because um, that could be the kiss of death to the business. If people correlate value with what you're offering them, then they're going to pay for it. And I'll give you an example. I make uh, glass beaded jewelry as a hobby. And I'm looking at developing that as a side hustle, as a form of passive income. And I was beta testing with some of the ladies at my church. And uh, I had a necklace, which is now my number one sell, um, bestseller. Uh, I was selling the necklace for $18. At $18, it wasn't selling. And I had one of two decisions. I could either lower the price to 16 or 15, or I could double the price to 35 or 36. So I decided, you know what, why don't I double the price? I'm gonna make this necklace 35 bucks. And interestingly enough, because people perceive the value to be much more, I, couldn't keep, I can't keep that necklace in stock. That's the necklace that is my number one bestseller, and it's the cheapest necklace to make. So it's all about perception of value. If you can convey to the end user or your customer that what they're getting for their money is a value, then you can, you can price to uh, whatever, you know, that's, that's reasonable. But it's the perception of value and you being able to effectively communicate that what you're giving them is a value. And drawing comparisons is, is a good way of doing that against your competitors. Okay, uh, I've got to wrap things up. I'm getting the thing. Okay, one more question and then we got to go have some pizza. Okay. <laughs> How do you what? How do you, you ask. <laughs> most, most times uh, when, when I've got mentees, I got last year, uh, my friend Audrey was here and these two guys came up to me, Abraham and Maj, and they said, hey, hey, we, we want you to be our mentor. Can you be our mentor? And I said, sure. And since then, we've had a really great uh, mentee-mentor relationship. We meet for coffee. We talk about a career. We talk about um, strategy. We talk I learn a lot of things from my mentees. I learned about tropic levels in fish, mercury levels in fish. Now I don't go and eat certain types of fish because uh, my mentee taught me about the mercury levels. So, you know, ask. 
Anyway, I just want to thank you guys for uh, taking the time to come tonight. Uh, I hope that some of this stuff that I've said here resonates with you. Uh, I hope that you find it constructive and useful. And please, if you want to talk to me on, on the pizza break or I um, look me up on, on Twitter, direct message me on Instagram. I'm at Carol Leeds, um, you know, and I've got just a very limited amount of, of business cards. But definitely look me up and I'd be glad to um, engage with you. All right. And I just want to wish you unbelievable success in your future endeavors. And it's such a pleasure being here with you tonight. Anyway, thank you. All right. And thank you again. All right. Thanks, guys.